Welcome back to Dallas Acting the Week. Now, didn't do the individual time trial breakdown that I said I would because some fellow dad cyclist might laugh at this. Juliet bought a stomach virus home from the nursery, which proceeded to wipe out all of us as a family for a good few days. So we'll just talk about both the men's and women's quickly now. Obviously it was a little bit of time ago, but yeah, it was still pretty, pretty significant. My predictions were very far from the truth. Ah, oh, no, that said, Rowan, Angry Rowan finished, finished third, which was, I couldn't tell if he was happy or not. Initially, I didn't think he was happy from the, from the TV pictures, but then afterwards, I think he was. Roglic winning, it was like, it was a surprise, but not a surprise. I, I felt Roglic has shown that form in TTs plenty of times. Like when it is a Roglic TT day and there's some hills in it, no one comes close. It's just, I think it's because we haven't seen it in a couple of years and, and the sort of the most recent memory of Roglic in a time trial is line stabbing Rowan at Harrogate or actually the TT in the tour last year where he didn't have a terrible ride but certainly was very much overshadowed by the ride of Pogaccia. I think a lot of people discounted Roglic, a lot of people asked why Roglic was going instead of Pogaccia but I think Roglic showed them. In, in terms of how it panned out, as expected the heat was, well I mean the storm didn't come but the heat was the main factor. We saw that in the second lap. On the first lap it was brilliant because all although Roglic was leading he was only leading by a fraction and everyone that you expected to be in the mix was. There you could you could throw a blanket over the over the favourites crossing that finish start finish line for the first lap, which was sort of geared it up for a real hard second lap. And and I'm not sure if Roglic increased his speed. I don't think he did. I think actually it was more people fading. And I know talking to a couple of guys that have been there, it was that second lap, that second hard climb that was really the sort of where it made or break made or broke your race. So and I think obviously Roglic really really showed that interesting. Uh, comparison to the road race, the top three in the road race came from the Tour de France, came from the the sharp end of the Tour de France, whereas the top three in the TT, none of them came from the Tour. Roglic started it, did a few days, pulled out, but everyone that did the Tour seemed to fade the hard, seemed to fade a bit harder in the second lap, and the guys that didn't do the Tour uh, were a bit fresher. The reason I think that is is down to heat prep. I think there's an argument to say that if you go to the tour you are doing heat acclimatization work because the tour is hot but there is a difference between doing heat acclimatization work where the idea is to get hot and stay hot and sort of contrastly in a race where you are your first and foremost thought is to stay cool so whilst you're getting hot you're actually physically trying to keep that core body temperature down but with the heat prep that you do in preparation for an event the idea is to increase your body temperature and then keep it there. So I think that was partly the reason for the for the tour guys dropping off as well. I might be wrong, just a sort of a gut feeling. In the women's race, Van Vleuten showed the form that she had in the road race and turned the silver into a gold. I mean, we're talking about angry Rome, but maybe we didn't talk about angry Annemiek Van Vleuten because I would imagine there's a few frustrations from that road race channeled into that TT. and. You know, like two years ago, Van Vleuten was like unstoppable. Last year, she was stoppable. I think what she's shown in this Olympics is she's sort of gone away, done a load of work. Like she's been at altitude for kind of ever and just doing some real hard training has just then laid that all out on the road in Tokyo. And yeah, then followed it up with a very classy San Sebastian win as well. So clearly got her form just right and annihilated the time trial, so that was mighty impressive. Unfortunately, my pre-race favourite in the women's was also Anna Kiesenhofer, and I know now that that spelling, that pronunciation, pronunciation, how to pronounce pronunciation is a different factor, but to how to pronounce Kiesenhofer is like that. So Austria didn't have a place in the TT, so unfortunately she couldn't start, so. And rounding out the podium was Marlon Reusser and Anna van der Breger. It's not a, I guess that's not a surprising podium at all. Those uh, Marlon Rossi is a huge, hugely strong time trialist. She's like the, I think she's like the Tim de Klerk of the women's peloton, but can churn out a pretty awesome TT as well. So, and Van der Breggen, current world champ. Don't really need to say much more. Yeah, that's a, a brief, a brief rundown of the TT. We'll crack into what's been happening since, because there's been a lot. There's always seems to be a lot, but there's been a lot. Uh, unsurprisingly, heroes of the week candidates, uh, Van Vleuten and Roglic, because they, 
won the Olympic TTs. Next up, Christina McKenzie. A name that could not be too familiar to a lot of you. She has just broken the record for lands into John O'Groats in the UK, taking in kind of 50 ish hours, 52 hours. I don't know the exact time, but it's, I mean, it's very much on the dark side of a six hour ride. And what's incredible is she's attempted it a few times and uh, come up short and now has made it happen. So if you if you want to have a look at that, uh, there is a chap on Twitter, uh, Michael Broadworth, who does some fantastic infographics of anyone that does. Kind of in the UK, we've got this wonderful time trial scene, time trial community, and part of that are point to point records, the most famous being the Land's End to the Johnny Groats, which is the bottom of the UK, furthest to the west, to the topmost north or east part of Scotland. Again, so BMX. Now, I didn't know much about before BMX, but God did I know a lot about BMX afterwards because what an amazing race to watch or races and just the fact that there's all these heats but then the final, like the final just comes down to one race. I cannot imagine the nerves going into a 45 second race where you, and it is a contact sport. Like I think every other aspect of cycling is a non-contact sport. BMX is classified as a contact sport. So best driver, she got the gold medal. Kai White got a silver medal, which is like the first, it's like historic, it's groundbreaking, it's you know the, the BMX and the, the photos coming from the BMX track in Tokyo were wonderful of Kai celebrating cheering on Beth and celebrating her win as much as he's celebrating his own silver medal was just very wholesome. Charlotte Worthington won the freestyle BMX again something I knew nothing about but and still definitely cannot claim to be any kind of expert on it but she landed a backflip 360. Now I can't do a wheelie for more than five or six pedal strokes, but she landed a backflip, backflip 360, which has never been done before in women's international competition, which I think pretty much automatically gave her the gold medal. And I've got Katie Archibald on here as well, because Team Pursuit, at the point of recording, we've just gone through round one of Team Pursuit qualifying. Already a lot's happened. The GB, uh, GB women are fully in the mix. The men are quite in the mix. Katie is my... <laughs> One of my candidates for Hero of the Week because her position on the bike is incredible. Like, it's nothing short of incredible. If anyone tried to hold that position, it would be for a few pedal strokes and unsustainable. Katie seems to be, she does the start, which isn't enormously difficult, but a two and a quarter lap start. And then does, like, she was doing the sort of stoker pull right at the end, which again, was just like, for me, I was like, Jesus, she is on another planet in terms of strength in a team pursuit. And, I think so far what I've seen from the team pursuit is there are, it's quite a large, not, this isn't specific to GB, this is across the board. I think the speeds are so high that the actual differences in abilities or strength between the riders is getting shown quite a bit more. There are a lot more teams crumbling in the last kilometer than I think we normally see in an Olympic games. My hero of the week, the winner though, is Beth Driver because she's from Essex. She's from right near, like she basically lives next to the Blue Egg. But also the story around Beth's road to the gold medal in Olympics. For the last two years, she's been supported by Team GB. For years before that, she was having to crowdfund because Women's BMX was not a uh, was not an, a, an event that was supported by I think UK Sport. And like hindsight's a wonderful thing. Retrospectively, UK Sport would be like, man, well, like we well, should have supported this. But like hindsight is hindsight is a dangerous thing to be sort of using as an argument for funding because. It's, it's, always, it's always a battle that you leave and like, you kind of lose. And what you have to do is roll back and, and funding is based, I think, I won't go into too much detail, but I think it's based on perspective, perspective medals. And at the time of funding, there wasn't the best driver. So like, hats off to Team GB for supporting her and hats off to Beth for winning the gold medal at the Olympics. Far bigger than winning Dale Sect in the week's hero in the week of the week. And there's, so, there's some, Great pictures where she's come back to Essex, gone back to Finching Field, which if you remember the Tour de France in 2014, there was like a natural, there was a little quaint village, which was like a natural stadium, which was filled with people that the tour went through. And that's where Beth's from. So that was pretty awesome to see that village pack. Well, WTF of the week, the Danish men, team pursuiters, the fact that they've gone so fast, all with such short sore shin injuries. You know, they've all got their shins taped up. I really hope they're okay for their injuries. I hope they recover okay for the subsequent rounds because having that tape on must be a distraction, must be, you know, really, it just must have been a worrying time for them coming into the Olympics with all those shin injuries that the Danish have. So I really hope that they're gonna be okay. I don't know what's caused it. I'd imagine 
maybe some football, maybe they were doing team suit with flat pedals and they like the pedals hit their shins. Like I don't know, but I really hope they're okay. Also, Alec Porter is in the qualifying round of the team suit, his track handlebars snapped. Now, again, this whole hindsight thing is like, hey, like man, that's real bad, like why do they make them things out of cream cheese? Like all of these things are tested pretty much to destruction and it's the Olympics, if something's gonna rock, go wrong, like it's probably gonna go wrong there if it's gonna be an absolute freak accident. I mean, you can prepare until the cows come home, don't get me wrong, but for of all those athletes, something is gonna go wrong for one of them. And unfortunately went wrong for Alex, Hats off, he got up, they went and did the second round. It looked to me like that really threw them a little bit. It just didn't look like the fierce, punchy Aussie team pursuit we expect. They qualified fifth, which means they won't physically win gold anymore. They can still win the bronze, and they're the fastest team possible in that section. Although, I just don't get it. But there's a bunch of rounds today, and then the finals are tomorrow, so... The last WTF is a lack of aerodynamic thinking and running. I mean, I thought cycling was behind the times. Like, I commented last week that some teams just think you need to pedal a bit harder. Lack of running, lack of error and running is mind blowing. Just flappy t-shirts and they run pretty quick. I mean, the sprinters are shifting to the point where error matters. That's not the WTF of the week. Upcoming, we've got more track. Like finishing the team pursuit, we've got the men's team sprint, which will be exciting. The Dutch are the favorites for that. And then we've got the bunch races, the Omniums and all of that jazz. So that's gonna be Good. Tour of Poland, Arctic race in Norway. Now, I was due to be doing Arctic. Not that we talk about me and Dow Sect in a week, but I was due to be doing Arctic. Unfortunately, at the point where we had to make a call if I was going or not, I was still, I was coming out the back end of stomach virus that we've had. The team said that I possibly would still be contagious, so they made the call for me not to go. So I'm sorry to Rick Zabel, who's had to go and replace me. I'm, I, I'm genuinely gutted because it's a race I've wanted to go to for a long time. It looks like an absolutely beautiful part of the world. It sounds it's like a very well organized race so I really hope the team does well. Hopefully I'll be back in Hamburg which is a one day world tour race followed by the Tour of Germany or Deutschland Tour. That's what's next for me. Tour of Poland. So we're, we're gearing it, getting back into some real big races before the world to kicks off. Then yeah, yeah, thanks for watching. Look, I know I signed off earlier but then this morning happened, the team pursuit again. Well, team sprint first, like the Dutch, I think the Brits went all out for that final, knowing that they'd have to produce something extraordinary to beat the Dutch and unfortunately it didn't quite work out. But it still came away with a silver medal. Second fastest time in Olympic history until the Dutch won, but the Dutch were worthy winners. Women's team pursuit, the Brits versus the Germans. Again, like stunning rides from both of them. The Brits didn't go as fast as they did in the qualifying rounds, but the Germans just I think produced something that was outside the realms of possibility for any other team in a 404, which was which is mind blowing again for for like the women's team pursuit team. If you think like 404 and then uh, Rio is one with a 410, which at the time was seen as like mind blowing. Uh, the, the just the track at the moment. Chanel's in the other room going, is that another Olympic record? And I'm like, yeah, like this is just technology and speed just moving on, and it's it's. It's wonderful to watch, but let's talk about the men's team pursuit quickly and add another hero to, of the week because a couple of things happened. We'll start with the Italians breaking the world record and the Kiwis, the Kiwis breaking world record as well. But you know, 0 0.09 of a second. So like that lot, like, like not even that, like that long was the difference. And the Kiwis doing a 342, which is crazy. So again, if you overlay that on the track against the winners, GB and Rio, they'd have caught GB for the half lap. So they've made a catch and then would have put another, then would have put an, another few meters into them before the finish line. So that's just a representation of just how fast the team pursuit has gone in a matter of five years. And obviously the Italians went even quicker. The Aussies went a 3.44, which is seriously fast, and they showed, I think I really feel for the Aussies because yesterday, I think I said before, they, they just didn't look 
on it once they had that rerun after that crash and this morning's run they didn't have Alex Porter who probably has pulled up very sore after the crash and they showed the sort of ferocity that I think that they lacked in yesterday's ride and 3.44 is a very stunning time 3.42 threes are even stunning uh, I'm so excited for the team pursuit oh then you had the Danes, you had the Danes, you had the Danes in their shin tape for a start. And there's a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people online, like there's a lot of teams have gone to the UCI and complained about it because it is a clear breach of the UCI rules. Now, what I think's happened, I, I'm not in Tokyo, I'm not talking to anyone in Tokyo, but if I know cycling, what has happened is the Danes have gone to the UCI and gone, hey, can we put kinesio tape on the riders? And the UCI have gone, Yes. I think that was the extent of the conversation between the Danes and the UCI. And then of course the Danes placed the tape in a very aerodynamic place. It, it's kind of, it works as a trip. I won't draw it, it'll take a lot of your time. It works as a trip to trip the air, keep the air, to detach the air earlier and make the vortex behind the calf much smaller. Now, and this is why in the UK scene, everyone wears knee high overshoes rather than UCI regulation, sort of halfway between ankle and knee high, very important UCI rule. And that is to optimize the air traveling around the front of your car, which is what those pieces of tape would have done, despite what I said this morning about the Danes being very injured. Ironically, one of them now is, because in the qualifying round, Madsen rode into the back of Charlie Tanfield. Now, at the time, the GB team was disintegrating. There was, Charlie had lost touch with the front two, I think Ethan Hayter and Ethan Vernon, or Ethan Hayter and Ollie Wood, I'm not sure, but he'd lost touch. Clearly, it hadn't been communicated yet to the two guys in front that Charlie had detached. Now, Charlie's speed would have then dropped quite significantly. I think the difference in speed between the two teams was about 5K an hour. As soon as you're on your own, Charlie's not going to be traveling at 65, 66k an hour. He's going to be traveling at like 58 dropping. Like the GB would have been hemorrhaging time there. The Danes possibly would have seen the team together and they ride very head down, just looking probably at the black line in between their tri bars and not looking up. Obviously ridden straight into the back of Charlie Tanfield, not expecting him to be there or a miscommunication. Now bear in mind, when you're doing 70k an hour for three and a half minutes, there is no communication. There's no, there's no one like tells you. There are eight people on the track. You clearly, as we saw today, you have to have your wits about you. Yeah, and, and I think the Dane possibly thought that Charlie was man four, not man three. Now man four, the time doesn't count for man four. The time counts for man three. So Charlie should have, like, would have, or man four would have been up, up around the top, or on the sorry, Cote d'Azur. Um, on the green, blue, whatever it's called on the inside, well out the way. Charlie was man three though, so Charlie had every single right to still be in that race. Even though the Danes were like clearly ahead of the Brits, about to make the catch, Charlie was in exactly where he should have been. And it was the Danes' responsibility to go around. Now, the other thing is when the catch is made, in some rounds the race is won, but the commentators kept enforcing that every team needs to post a time in these rounds. The Danes didn't post a time, still go to the gold medal ride off. I think what it's what it shows is a bit of a hole in the UCI regs. Maybe uh, not the best qualification system. Maybe just a simple knockout. If you make the catch, you're knocking out. Way would be better. I, I, I don't know. Just, you know, like we said, hindsight is a wonderful thing. However, the Danes did not finish the race, but they did make the catch, which is how they've got through to the gold medal ride off. As per the rules, it seems, the Brits knowing that they needed to record a time, got up, Charlie got up, finished the race, like four minutes 28, which is terribly slow, but actually still quite fast, and have qualified last. So I think that is them pretty much out of the competition. They might be in the seventh and eighth place, got like met seventh or eighth place ride off tomorrow. Where they would have been, I don't know. It wouldn't have been a 428, it would have been a three something. So where that would have put them, we don't know. What they would have been riding for, we don't know. But that crash took them. I think what, G, what GB's gripe was, that crash has taken them out of the possibility to ride off with bronze. That is, I think that's where there's a hole in the rules is the Danes took out the Brits. There's no way of arguing that. And the Brits haven't had a fair chance of showing what they could do whatever that would have been. That's my take on the crash. And in my timeline with some very angry Danish people. Some, and I think, and that leads me to the last point, is the people complaining about the fact that teams or other teams went to the commissaires to complain about the rule, the 
rule breaking that the Danes have been accused of, which is the shin tape, as we talked about, their aero under vests, uh, which is something, which is a rule that is super vague. I think I don't know the rules, so I'm not going to comment too much on that. But the, I think the problem isn't so much with the aero properties of the undervest, or maybe it is. The problem there is of when that undervest was available, and there's a whole thing around everything that's used in the, in the Olympics has to have been available before a certain date. For example, you'll see Aero Coach have dropped their aero chainring, which has which is there to gain 25 centimeters per lap at 60 60 kilometers an hour. That can't be used in the Olympics because that's only just become available. It wasn't available before the set date. So that was the, the third rule value. If you compare cycling to Formula One, uh, there's two reasons that you know, a team will go and complain about another team breaking the rules. One, because it's cheaper. If, if another team has seemed to have not so much break the rules, but find a way around the rules, like manipulated the rules, it's a lot cheaper to complain and get that team to stop using that item than it is to develop that item yourself. The second thing, all of these teams have put their heart and soul for the last five years or longer into winning this race. And when you look at another team that is, and look at like getting a rule book and saying, we need to follow these rules, following these rules, and then looking at another team, whether they're going fast or slow, but looking at the team going, oh, they haven't followed the rules, this isn't fair. And that's, and whilst it doesn't look fair at the time that a team will be complaining about another team, what's not fair is another team like not following the rule book. Now, obviously, ultimately, it comes down to the UCI. So I don't think the blame should ever be put on another team for calling out a possible rule violation to the UCI. Ultimately, we're seeing Italy, Denmark showdown which I think is is the right, although I think the big losers there are the Kiwis, because clearly outside of, if Denmark had been DQ'd, then you're looking at an Italy, <coughs> New Zealand final. I think the qualifying rounds, anything to go by, that could be, that would have been horrendously close again. We are looking at a Denmark, Italy final, and what I don't understand is with the Kinesio tape, why Denmark didn't just save it for the final. If they thought they were going to get away from it with it, and it's a game, why didn't they just save it for the final? And people complain about the rule, complain about it once they've got the gold medal in their hands. So, and instead of having a lot of teams complaining about it, they might have just had two. The team that finished second and the team that finished fourth, because they're the only teams with something to gain. That's the only thing that, for me that I don't understand about the shin tape from the Danes. If they thought they were going to get away with it, why bring it out in the qualifying? If, if they thought they are going to get away with it, but deep down they knew that it is very close to the rules, why bring it out for the qualifying round if they're confident of going fast enough? The final hero to the week, I'm just adding Ed Clancy because he announced his retirement. Ed's been on the plan for as long as I've known, as long as I've been involved with GB Cycling. He's one of the nicest. When road and track sort of separates, Ed's always been a common guy in the middle, like you'll see him at the Tour of Britain, he is loved by everyone. And I think that when someone is that admired by everyone, male, female, old, young, journalist, staff member, kitchen lady, CEO, you know that that is down to their personality. Obviously a phenomenal athlete, but a better person and a massive like cat fan as well. So I really, Wish him all the well, all the best in his retirement, and I hopefully still see him around because in terms of team pursuit, he's legendary. So he's my last hero of the week, Captain. Anyway, thanks for watching the extra bit. See you next week.